Okay, welcome everyone. What I want to do here is I want to do a couple of example problems. What I'll do is I'll do two example problems from both the rules of replacement, the rules one, the rules of replacement two, the con conditional and the indirect proof. So I'm going to do a whole series of problems here. So most of you probably don't need to watch the entire video. You, what you can do is you can just sort of fast forward um, what we're going to work on when you get there if you haven't got to those sections. But I figure I should pro post this for everyone now. Okay, so let's start off with the rules of replacement one, right? And then just to sort of get a sense of what the rules of replacement one entails, right? Um, the first five, this is uh, rules of replacement number one, and this is rules of replacement number two. Now, for those of you taking the course online, in my online course, you have a PDF version of this whole thing. I encourage you to print this out. But that means that the rules we're going to be looking at in this first problem are going to be the De Morgan's, commutativity, associativity, distribution, and double negation. Here are the rules here. I'm going to put this off to the side because I'm going to be using this. Um, but you, but I'm not going to keep showing you because it will take too much time because I want these this video to be as short and sweet as possible. Okay. So our first premise here is Q, then we get Q and X or Z and not Y, okay? And then the conclusion we're looking for here is not Q or Y, okay? So here's the is example problem. And if you, this is, I think, question number five on the Aptos exercise series. Okay, so here's what we have to do. What can we do from here, right? Um, you can say, you can take a look here. And what You can see the conclusion here. The first thing I would look at is the conclusion. The conc And remember, this is not, this doesn't count as a valid line, right? But I could do, a lot of what I do is I sort of reverse engineer the proof, beginning with the conclusion. So the conclusion here could be not Q and not, why if you did a um, De Morgan's, right? And which means that if you can get the not Q by itself, you already have the not Q by itself, then all you have to do is conjoin it with not Y. Now here's not Y, which means we need to get this thing by itself. And if we could conjoin these, we could do a De Morgan's and end, end up with the conclusion. So the question is, how? what can we do here, right? You notice what you need to, the first rule you should look at here is whenever you have conjunctions, and a disjunction is to think about either distribution or associativity, right? And let's sort of, sort of write over here on the side. What does the distribution rule look like? Um, the distribution rule looks like this, that if you have P and Q or P and R, oh, that's a problem. Notice I don't, this isn't two Ps. These don't have the same value. So that means that this can't be a distribution, which is a bummer. I was hoping it would be. So then the question is, right, because if you have this, then the rule of distribution says that you could get to um, P and Q or R. But you can see the problem is I need a P in both places, but I don't have that. So you can see distributions off the list. So what about associativity? Could we use an associativity? Remember, the rule of associativity says that now, the rule of associativity would demand that this thing right here, well, here, let me just write out the rule of associativity because it doesn't look anything like that, right? Associativity looks like this, P and Q or R, right, is logically equivalent to P or Q or R, right, or with disjunctions, right? But we don't have that. This is not what we have here. Hmm. What are we supposed to do here? What if, what if we added something? This may be the way to do it, actually, when I think about it. Yeah, I think that's what we're supposed to do. What I think is, listen, take a look here. What about this Q? What if we added a not X? So what if we did this? We did not Q or not X, right? And that would be line one addition, right? But now that I've done that, can't I do the De Morgan's in reverse? Because remember, the De Morgan's also says, just to throw it up here, right? Uh, the De Morgan's also says that if you have not P or not R, that that's logically equivalent to saying, well, you must not have Q 
Q or R, right? And that's exactly what we sort of have here. I should have used P and Q, but whatever. Um, so that means let's do a De Morgan series. Then you get a not Q and X. So that's line three De Morgans, right? But now that I don't have this, I can use the constructive dilemma to get here, right? The constructive dilemma. So that means line five here is going to be Z and not Y, right? And what I've used is line four and two um, disjunctive syllogism, because remember, if I this says that I don't have Q and X, but here's Q and X, so I must actually have this thing here, Z and Y. You can see, remember I said I needed to get the ne negative Y or the negation Y by itself. So let's commutate and then simplify. So that's going to be not Y and Z. That's line five commutation, where all we do is switch sides. Now seven, we're just going to get not Y by itself. So that's line six simplification. Now that we have this, let's conjoin one and seven together. Um, so line eight here is going to be not Q and not Y, right? That's line one and seven, conjunction. And now that I've conjoined this, let's do our De Morgan. So you can see our little strategy is finally working out. So line nine ends up with not Q or Y. Okay, so that's the proof for that one. This seemed like a tricky problem, but really all we had to do here um, you can see I w once I checked to see if distribution or association work, which neither of them do, that led me immediately to think there must be another way to do this. And then I thought, wait a second, if I need this at, right, I can just add it with the disjunction if I do it to Morgan's. The trick was to know I needed to do a negative X, not just an X, because if I'd done an X, it would have completely con com uh, resulted in a different result. Okay, so this is the first problem here you can see with the rules of replacement. So let's do a second problem. Um, let's see here. Okay, so this is a second problem using the rules of replacement one. Let me throw it up here. We have not, not Q and not Y. Line two is we have Q then X and Z. Line three is we have Q, then not Z, and Y, then not X. Okay, and the conclusion we're looking for here is not Q. So we just want to get Q by itself. So this is a seemingly deceptive problem, right? So write this problem down, pause the video, and see if you can figure out how to do it. If not, turn the video back on. Hopefully, I'll have figured out how to do it. Okay, line four here. You can see, let's try to do our reverse engineering strategy. If I if I need the not Q, where is the not Q? Well, here's a not Q here, but you can see that if I do it to Morgan's, I'm going to end up with a disjunction here, and then this is just going to turn into Q. But maybe that's okay. Well, it's a problem here with the disjunction. You can see if I could get Q by itself, I could get X and Z here. Uh, and this almost looks like a constructive dilemma, doesn't it? Right? Because I've got two conjunctions and an addition. So that means I either have if I can get Q or Y, I could result in Z, not Z or not X. Maybe that has something to do with here. I'm not sure what to do, actually. So the question is, what can we do? So let's take a look at our rules of replacement, right? Um, let me actually just throw them up here on the board. Because I think what you have to do with some of these problems is you actually just have to spend some time taking a look at the problems. Let me see if I can get that. Um, focus in for you. Okay, so hopefully you can see that better, right? I don't know if you can, right? But let's take a look at our problem here, right? We have, so here are my rules of replace. I wish I could show you this better. Uh, so here are my rules of replacement. Here's the problem I have. I'm just putting it off to the side. This is how I would work it. Well, you can see I can do it to Morgan's here. Remember, my other tip is if you don't see what you can do, just do something if you can see it. This is a possible to Morgan. So let's try to put it up there. If we did it to Morgan's, it would come up with not, not Q or not, not Y, right? Because this would go into both of these. The sign would change. So that would be line one to Morgan's. Of course, immediately you think you hit Q or Y, right? Uh, basically, line four, I just did the double negations to get rid of these things. So now I have Q or Y. Uh, I think we are going to have to do a constructive dilemma. 
right? Because if now that I have Q or Y, right, that means that I can conclude I must have not Z or not Q, right? Not X, I'm sorry. So let's do that. So that must mean I have not Z or not X, right? And that is line three and five, constructive dilemma, right? And so now that I have not Z or not Y, couldn't I do it to Morgan's on this too? But why would I do that is the question. I can see I can do one, but I'm not sure why it would help me here. Exactly. You can see here, so then the next question is, take a look at this, this thing up here. Is there anything we can do with this? Well, the problem is the rules of uh, replacement one doesn't really deal with conditionals. Um, so it looks like if I could get, uh, maybe that's what I need to do. I see it. Let's commutate this. So this would be not X or not Z, right? Line six. I don't know why people always put little lines there. Um, that's line six commutation. Now that I've commutated it, let's do the De Morgans. So that means I get not X and Z, right? Because remember, when you caught, when you do the De Morgans, right, you basically, you, sorry, the sound effects, but you pull out the negations and change the sign out of the parentheses. So now that I don't have this, uh, now I see it, right? Because now I can use a modus tollens here because this, uh, the, this X and the Z here are right here, but line eight says that I don't have this. So if I don't have this, I must not have Q, not Q. And that was... Are the thing we we're looking for, right? So this one really didn't use many of the rules of replacement, it only used the De Morgans and the double negation, okay? Um, so that's an example problem. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pause the video and then we'll do example problems from the rules of replacement two. Right, so let me pause the video and then I'm gonna pull up some new problems here. Okay, so we're going to do the rules of replacement too. I found a new problem. Um, so here's what it looks like. First line is if R, then B. Two is it's either not R or not V. And the conclusion we're looking for here is not R. Okay. So here's the problem here. Uh, you can say, say, what can we do here, right? Immediately, whenever you see a disjunction with two negations, I always think to Morgan's. I don't know if we needed to Morgan's, right? Um, but if I see it, I usually just do it, and it, I usually find that it works out. Sometimes not, but R and V. That's line two to Morgan's, right? Okay, now that didn't really do much for me. What else could I use here? Now let's let's go back and take a look at the rules of replacement here. Let me move this. Sorry, that's my coffee cup making noises. Um, so here you go. You can see the rules of replacement right here. Um, so we'll keep these off to the side um, to see if that can help us, right? And even though it may be too small for you guys to be able to see everything. Let me move it over here. Okay, so hopefully you can see that. Um, but at least here's what I would do if I were you, is put the problems right next to you. Okay, so now you can see I used the De Morgans there. Maybe I didn't need to do the De Morgans. What else could I do? Remember, I had a disjunction here. So out of all of these rules, does any of these look like? You can see associativity requires three variables. I only have R and V, so it's probably not going to be using associativity or distribution. I do have this thing right here, a conditional. Now remember, transposition and material implication use the conditionals. So you can see here, I have a, I could use either one of these, right, to see if it would be helpful. Well, let's, the question is, which one should we do? Um, well, I'm not sure. Let's just start off with the material implication here. So that means that I'm going to use line one to do the material implication, which means that means it's going to go from not R or V, right? That's line one material implication, I'll just put, um, okay. Now that I've done the material implication, the question is, is that going to be helpful for me? I'm not sure, you're right. I, what I need is this not R by itself. So if I could get a not, not V, if I could get V by itself, that would work. Um, but also, but that means it would require me to get R. I don't have R here. How am I going to do this? Well, let's try a transposition too. Why not? Um, maybe that'll help us. Um, so let's going to see the transposition turns into not V, then 
not um, R. All right, yeah. Okay, because it basically switches it around from not Q to not P. Okay, so now I have this line. This was line one. I did the same line. That was just a transposition. So the question is, what can I do? You could see here, it almost seems like I could possibly, if I, this was not a negative, then it seems like I could potentially um, make a hypothetical syllogism. That doesn't seem possible. What about the other ones here? What about exportation? Could we set up an exportation if we combined a P and Q, then R? Hmm. Nope. Let's see here. I'm gonna... Okay, so I actually paused the video here and tried a couple different things um, and started getting... started trying to get a little frustrated here with this problem, just like you. Uh, I want you to know that these problems are not easy for everyone, uh, for anyone, I think. I mean, unless you're a savant, uh, which I'm not. Um, but now I realize what the answer is. So let me go through this problem. So um, let's go back here. We did an implication on line one, right? But wait a second, can we also do an implication on line two, right? Remember, the rule of implication looks like this, right? Which means that you can see here that my Q is going to be my negative V, right? So let me highlight all of this. So I'm going to use the negative V here as my Q, right? And then my R here becomes my P. So if I use the rule of implication, what happens here is I end up with R then not V, right? Notice that this got cut out, but not this because of the rule of implication here. So that's line two implication. Right, and now that I've created the implication here, right? Notice the um, where is it here? Um, notice this right here, not v, not r, right? When we did this transposition, can we set up a hypothetical syllogism now? So that means you end up with seven r, right? Then not r, right? Um, and that's line five and six, hypothetical syllogism, right? Because uh, remember, in the hypothetical syllogism, my not v here basically functions as the middle term. It's sort of kind of the quick way. I sort of that's how I see it visually, sort of like shoots and ladders. But now look, now that I have the nar r or not r, how am I supposed to get this thing? Uh, we'll take a look at the transposition rule, right? The transposition rule looks like this, where um, let's see here. Let's see here. Well, wait, actually, wait, no, take a look. It's the implication rule here, right? Because the implication rule says that the Q is going to stay the same, but the a negation gets added when we change the sign. So that means that I'm going to get not R or not R, right? Line 7 implication. And then now that I have not R or not R, well, that means that's just a tautology. So that's line 9 is going to be not R, line 8 tautology. Right. This, I think, is actually a fairly sort of difficult problem, um, simply because you had to set up a hypothetical syllogism in order to do it. And you can see where I went wrong originally was I started doing implication. Well, actually, the transposition I needed, but this first implication I didn't need. I should have done the implication here. Right. Um, so it just takes time to do these. And oftentimes you just got to sit down, and sort of scratch, scratch your chin and sort of work through the problem. So. Um, let me let me do one more problem from rules of replacement two now. Okay. So in this next problem, let me write it out here. I'm going to keep the rules here so you can sort of look at them as we're going. Um, the first thing here is v if and only if j. Two is v or j. Three is v then not j or r. Right, and the conclusion we're looking for here is. R. Okay, whoops, sorry, I didn't realize you could see it. Okay, so that's the problem here. Let's see what we can do. First thing we should notice is I need to get R by itself. Here's the R right here. So if I could get a not not J and I had this sequence by itself, I could use a disjunctive syllogism. Um, this is sort of, again, my reverse engineering strategy, which is, well, R, I could get that from a disjunctive syllogism. 
right? If I had, um, if this was a not, not, if I had a not, not J, right? Which means if I could get a J by itself, right? I could get it. So then the question is, well, you can see here's my J. My J is trapped up here with these biconditionals and this disjunction. You know, there's a lot of different things I could do. And one of the difficulties of this section is simply the fact that there's so many possibilities. Um, there's so many things you can do. Okay. Well, let's see. The first thing I notice is since I have one, two, three unique variables in line three, that immediately should draw your attention to the material equivalence. I'm sorry, not the material equivalence, to the exportation rule here, right? I mean, we should ask, can we use exportation? Well, look, exportation would require uh, a, con a conjunction. It would have to be on this side. Um, so that's not going to work for us. Let's go check out the other possibilities. What about a distribution here? Well, this has a conditional, which means that I can't use distribution or associativity. So then that leaves me, wait a second, could I use a transposition here? I could... Um, I could reverse these things and do a transposition. Um, oh, no, wait. No, I'm wrong. You, Yeah, you could. So let's do a transposition since I see that as a possibility. Um, but wait, well, let's check with the implication first because you can see that transposition and implication are difficult because they both have a P then Q structure. So I, if I can ever if I can ever do a transposition, I should always consider the material implication too. So what would the material implication be like for this? Well, um, that would turn into a not V or not blah, 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 blah. Um, well, that or may allow me to do a distribution or something. Let's do that. That seems like a more hopeful strategy to me. So that's going to be not V or um, not J or R, okay? Now that I have the sort of the, the disjunctions here, notice the rule of associativity, right? The rule of associativity looks like this, right? Um, if I have, if P um, or Q or R, I can always logically replace that with P or Q or R. Um, so maybe I should do that right here. That seems like the something I could do just immediately is use associativity here. So if I use associativity, what's going to happen is I need to transform it into this sequence here. So that's going to look like this. You're going to end up with not V or not J or R. Okay. So, oops, I forgot to write these things down. So what do we do here? This was line three implication and this was line four associativity right so now that we've done associativity will that help us here right we'll take a look i'm not sure exactly how the associativity helps us because remember my goal is to get this so if i could get not v or j that might work for me potentially right we'll take a look at line two here what if i did a um, a double negation in front of this entire sequence. Could I do a De Morgan's and get this? Maybe. That seems like a possibility. Let's try it. So then you end up with not, not, V, or J. That was line two De Morgan's, right? Uh, not De double negation, double negation. Now I have a De Morgan's here. So it seems like I can do that. So, oh, but it changes the sign. That's the problem I have. Um, cause I was hoping if I could get this, get rid of this, cause let me just show you what I was thinking. Cause then you would end up with not, not V and not J, right? That'd be line six to Morgan's, but you can see here, I have to keep this negation carried over. So I have to keep the parentheses and then, but I have to change the sign. Once I change the sign, this thing doesn't work anymore. So my hopeful strategy of using a disjunctive syllogism to get over by itself has failed. So it's likely that I don't need these two lines. I'll just sort of mark them off. But remember, even though I these two lines I may not need, they're still going to be valid sequences. So maybe later on I could find a different way to do the problem. Remember, many of these problems actually have multiple proofs possible. Right? Well, let's go back here to line one. We haven't done anything with line one yet. We do have two rules, right? From we I'm sorry, we have one rule, material equivalence, that lets us sequence this out. Um, so which one would be best? Uh, I'm, I'm going to say, 
I'm not sure, but let's, I have a feeling it's the disjunction because most of this stuff has disjunctions um, and conditional and conjunction. So let's do that. I actually don't see it right at the moment. Um, so you could just do both if you wanted. Uh, maybe that's a helpful strategy. So if I do a material implication on this, I'll end up with um, V then J and J then V. Right, that's line one uh, equivalence. But you can see there's another way I can do the equivalence. I'm going to do that way as well. So then I end up with V and J or not V and not J. Okay, that's line one equivalence too. You can see I can do it multiple times of the same sequence. The chances are I only need one of these. I'm not sure which one I need at the moment. Uh, but let's see what we can do with that. Once we have the equivalence, um, what can we do with V or not J? Right? Well, we did this double negation, remember? Um, and when we did this double negation, we did the De Morgans, which gave us this. Ah, oh, wait a second. If this, take a look at this. Doesn't it look like I have this sequence here? Let's do a commutation. Because uh, look, I have this sequence right here identically. So now maybe I can do... Uh, disjunctive syllogism so but I have to commutate this first that's not V and not J or V and J that's line 9 commutation once I've commutated it right take a look this sequence is the same as this sequence which means that if I don't have this then well I must have this thing right here so that means line 11 is going to be V and J Right, that's lines seven and ten, disjunctive syllogism. Right, and now that I've done those, so line twelve. What's line twelve going to be here? You can see I can get v by itself. If I get v by itself, I can unlock this sequence where I have not j or r. Uh, but I don't have not j by itself here. Let's see here. So, but once I have this, maybe I'm not seeing it. Let's simplify to get V. Tells me in line 11, simplification, right? And now that I've simplified it, line 13, and I have V, wait a second here. Let's hold on a second. Okay, so we have the V by itself, but you can see here, if we do the V, we'll get not J or R. That's not going to really help us. What we need here um, is we need to somehow change this sequence. Notice we did it on line four. We did an implication. But we did an implication on the entire line. Could we also do an implication right here? Right? Because remember, the implication says if you have not P or Q, you can just change it to if you have P, then you have Q. So let's do that as well. So let's do line three. Let's do an implication again. Right? And so the next implication here is going to be if you have V, then you have J, then you have R. Right? Notice I have V and J here. So line 14 here. Let me scoot it up here. Line 14 was going to be line 11, simplification, right? And over here, this was line 3, implication again. You can see I just implicated a different part of the sequence. I just implicated this, right? But I left this. That's one of the beauties of the rules of replacement is I can just replace a partial part. I can just replace one part of a larger statement. So now that I have this, 15 means I'm going to get if you have J, then you have R. Right, that's line 12 and 13, modus ponens, right? Sorry, I'm running out of space here. Line 16, I have J, so that means I must have R. That's line 14 and 15, um, modus ponens as well, okay? And I finally got to my R. Now, you can see here, there's a number of things that I did here that are actually not necessary. And if you were, for instance, going to publish a proof, which obviously you would publish this thing, um, but you can see here that 
you could clean this proof up and reduce it. But when you're working on a problem for the very first time, don't be afraid to just do what you can. Um, I think that's an important, I think you should feel that freedom when you're doing these problems. And you'll probably do much better, okay? So I'm gonna pause the video here now and I'm gonna put on a conditional problem and then an indirect proof problem. Okay, so now I'm gonna do a, um, an indirect proof problem and it, as well as a conditional proof problem. Um, somehow I've just dropped my pen. Where did I put it? Oh, here it is. Okay. So let's start with an indirect proof. Uh, well, no, let's start with the conditional proof. And I'm just going to do one of these problems just as a practice problem. These, in terms of, at least if you're taking my course, uh, the, the indirect proofs are not as important as the conditional proofs. Um, so let's go back here. Okay, sorry about the, the delay here, guys. Um, okay, so let's do this problem here. This is not a... We have not a, um, then C, then D, and not Q. Line two is we have not a, then B or C. Line three here is we have B, then C. And the conclusion we're looking for here is not Q. Okay, we well can see not Q is here, so this is the reverse engineering strategy again. If not Q is here, then that means if I can get this sequence by itself, because this is a conjunction, I could simplify it. So in order to get this, I'm going to need this thing right here. Um, I don't see that, right? And I, I do see that if I had a not A, I could get B or C. And then I could do something with this, perhaps. Uh, I'm not exactly sure what to do here, but you can see that what I definitely need is I need this conditional statement, right? So in order to get this conditional statement, let's go ahead and do a conditional proof, right? So here's what we're gonna remember. We're gonna write it off to the side, right? Anything written off to the side means um, that it's assumptive, right? Because it means that it's based on our assumption that we have to eventually discharge. So let's assume not A. So that's our ACP for the assumption for the conditional proof. Now that I have this, I obviously get B or C, right? I get B or C. Um, and that is line four, modus ponens, right? So then the question becomes, okay, I have B then C. Well, what can I do with that, right? Um, B or C, there's not much I could do. I mean, I could do double negations and sort of try to do something, but I don't see how that's really going to help me, right? Because ultimately what it looks like I'm going to need to do is if I can create, um, since I have B or C by itself, if I could create a phrase, because I have B and C, um, right, if I could add something to this, I could create a constructive dilemma, for instance, if I could, because I have B or C now, what if I had C or C? That'd be kind of crazy. Well, let's see if what we can do with that. What if we did, we're looking for this phrase, I'm sorry, C then C, right? If you get, if Charlie comes to party, then Charlie's going to come to the party, right? Could I create a conditional phrase for this? Well, let's look, line six here. Let's just do another conditional proof. We're gonna embed it even further in. And this is gonna be, we're gonna assume C. There's another assumption for a conditional proof, right? If I assume this, right? Um, I could use the rule of tautology to get C or C, right? So that would be line six tautology. And, you know, normally we would use the tautology to reduce, but we can also use it to add to the sequence, right? Um, if you get this, right, if you use a tautology here, um, then that means I could do, this seems sort of like cheating, but it's not. I could do another tautology to get to C, right? Um, so that would be line seven tautology. 
which means that I could conclude this, which is a truism. Maybe when I said that, if Charlie goes to the party, then Charlie's going to go to the party. That seems like a tautology. We can actually use the rule of tautology to validate this sort of thing. So that means let's discharge it. So we're back on this sequence here. Let me go down a little bit. Um, that means I can say, if you have C, then you have C, right? And that's lines, I think I'm... One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Oh, so this was line eight, so this is line nine. Sorry about that. So that's line six through eight, conditional proof. Now that I have that, let's conjoin these two things together. So you get B or C, I'm sorry, if B then C, and if C then C, right? And that's lines nine and three conjunction. Right, And now that I have these, remember, I have this thing. If I have B or C with the constructive dilemma, that means I must have C uh, or C. Right? That's, so that's lines 5 and 10. Con um, constructive dilemma. Of course, immediately when you see this, I think tautology. So that means I've got C. So that is going to be... Uh, line 11, tautology. Now the question is, now that I have C, what do I need to do with this? Now remember, because this is a conditional proof, right, the not A here is going to end up as my um, antecedent, and this is going to end up as my consequence. So if I discharged it right now, because you can discharge at any point, but once you do, you can't use any of these extra lines, I would get not A, then C. Right? Does that help me here? Right? Because if I get not A, then C. Right? Well, wait a second. That's this. I can do it. And I can get my Q. Okay, so I must discharge right here because I can use modus ponens because this sequence is the same as this sequence. So I'm running out of room here. So let's pull it up here. So line 13 is going to be... Um, D, no, no, I'm sorry, I have to discharge to me, not A, then C, and that's the conditional proof starting with line 4, that was line 4 through 12, conditional proof. So now that I have that, I can use modus ponens with the sequence here, because this is the same. Uh, so that means I get this, so line 14 becomes, if you have, you have D and not Q, that's lines 1 and 13, uh, modus ponens. Now, of course, I just need to get the not Q by itself. That's really simple. I need to commutate first, though. That's not Q and D. Line 14 is a commutation. Since I've commutated line 16, I can get not Q by itself by line 15, simplification. Right? So this really was sort of a nasty problem. Um, you can see it required some really creative thinking. And I think this part right here would have been very difficult for many people to, to think about how to do it. Um, because, but you can see here that what we've given here internally is actually the proof of tautology, right? This is, we've given a proof for tautology, I'm sorry, we've given a proof um, that P then P is a tautology as well, right? And notice this is interesting because that means, I mean, in a sort of interesting way, we could make this a new rule of replacement if we wanted because we just proved it. Um, we're not going to do that because... Since we proved it this way, why do we need to introduce a new rule, okay? So that's how we did the proof here. So I'm going to do one more proof here. I'm running out of space here. Let's do a proof from the indirect. Let's do an indirect proof, right? And I'm going to pull this from the Aplia homework as well. And while I'm pulling this up, let me just remind you again, these are very, very, some of these are very difficult. And you'll see that the, the exams that I put on the test aren't quite as difficult. I really just want you to learn the mechanics of doing the indirect and the conditional proof. And part of the reason I say that is because we're going to see these things come back after we introduce predicate logic here next week. So um, let me do a, oops. So, so these things is really practice, practice, practice. And this stuff is difficult, right? I'm not expecting you to solve everything amazingly in one moment here, okay? So let me do, let's see here, problem three in the Aplia set. Uh, and remember, these are going to be conditional as well as indirect proofs. So here's the first 
here's the first line here is y and w then not u and by the way i think these problems are actually really fun um i sort of enjoy just sitting next on the couch you know uh, with the glass of wine and the fire going and just running through these problems. I think it's actually fairly enjoyable. Um, I'm sure some of you think I'm totally crazy. Um, <laughs> but I think it actually is rather enjoyable. Okay, so let's start with this problem. Now, since this is an indirect proof problem, we're, of course, we're going to be using the indirect proof. Remember, the indirect proof works a little bit differently, right? When we make an assumption, the goal of our assumption is to find a contradiction. And if we can find a contradiction then we can conclude the negation or the opposite of the assumption, right? Um, and this is a very, very powerful tool. In fact, you'll see that if you went back to some of the problems we did in the exercises um, in the rules of replacement, you'll see that the indirect proof would have helped you uh, tremendously, uh, right? Okay, so let's sort of take a look at it. Notice we have this sort of thing, I always start with the conclusion again. Of course, you could see that this eventually could be made into, a, let me write it up here. Um, actually, let me just write it on right here on this page here, right? This is, right? So if we did the reverse engineering strategy, you could do it to Morgan's potentially, and that would be not Y and W. Um, you can see I do have a Y and W here. But I'd have to turn this, get rid of this somehow. You can see, so if I could get not W, right, I could use a modus tollens to get this. So, I'm sorry, not not use, which means that if I did a double negation, I need a U. So if I get the U, I'd be in good shape here. You can see here the U in the second line is buried, which means I need a W here. Uh, so what can I do here, right? Well, wait a second. What if I just did, since I need this, one of the things I could do is what if I just um, did a negation of this whole thing instead, right? To prove it, that's some, one of the strategies with the indirect proof is you can always make the, you can do, um, you can turn the conclusion into your assumption here, or use the conclusion to make assumption. Instead of doing all of this, because I'm thinking, what if I did not W with that result? It may actually work out. But let's try this, actually. The, let's start with the simple one, which is, what if we assume the opposite of this thing? Could, that could we use that as our conclusion in a better sense? So let's do that. So let's make this our assumption, not, not Y or not W. Notice this is not a De Morgan since I kept the um, disjunction here. Okay, so if I assume this, this is going to be my AIP, right? And I'm writing off to the side here. It's line five here. So if I don't have this thing, well, what could I do? Well, obviously, I could do it to Morgan's. So that's going to be not, not Y and not, not W, right? So that's line four to Morgan's. Now, of course, you can see with the double negation rule, I can just simplify this to Y and W. That's line five, simplification, I'm sorry, double negation. Notice one thing, I did a double negation for both this, for the Y and the W simultaneously. Um, some of your logicians out there will see that as sloppy work. Um, is that ultimately, if you're, you, the rule of double negation is only for one sequence um, at a time. Um, and so some, some of your professors may see this as actually being a little too, too quick and too loose. I frankly think that if we just put a little footnote in the use of our rules, that the double negation, where you can use it multiple instances whenever you see it, I think that works. Um, but I'm sure some of the important logicians out there will completely disagree. But anyway, you can see I get the Y and the W by themselves. So that means Y here. That's line six, simplification. You can see here's my Y. I can unlock this. But you can see I'll just need this to do the same thing with the W. So let's just do that now. So that means I'm going to get... W and Y, that's line six commutation. Line nine here is going to be W, line eight simplification. Now I'm going to just, obviously I can use a modus ponens to get each of these, right? Because I have my Y here, my Y up here, I have my W here, I have my W here, so I can unlock these two, two guys right there. So let's do that. 10 and 11. So that's, remember, this is all still within the, 
my goal again is to get a contradiction. I haven't got there yet. I'm not sure how I'm going to. But let's hope we do. Okay. So that means I get if you have x, then you have u. So that's line 2 and 9, modus ponens. And of course, if you have, you either have x or you have not w, that's line 7 and 3, modus ponens. Right? Uh, so the question is, what do I do here now? How can I get a... Um, how can I get a contradiction going here? Well, take a look. I do have a not W here. What if I was able to actually use, um, let's see here. What could I use to, to change this equation? I'm wondering if I could set up um, a hypothetical syllogism here. In terms of my rules, let me pull my rules out. Right. Let's see here. Let's see here. Let me pause it for just a second. Let me think through what I'm about to do. Okay. Here's the thing. I realize I'm missing a premise that I need here, and I skipped it. Remember when I got this y and this w? I immediately simplified it, and then did the did the I did the simplifications, and then I did the modus ponens. But notice when I had the y and w, I forgot about this line sequence up here, line one, which says if you have y and w, you must also have not u. And that'll help me quite a bit here because notice I have this u. So let's put not u. That's line six and one, modus ponens. Now, if I don't have u, that means number 13. I must not have x, right? So if I don't have x, right, so that's line 12, 10 and 12 disjunctive syllogism and then line 14 if I write you can see here if I don't have X right then I must have not W I have have not W that's the disjunctive syllogism 13 and 11 disjunctive syllogism again right so then 15 is my conjunction because I have now have a W and a not W W and not W, right? That's line 9 and 14 um, conjunction. If I've conjoined it, that's a contradiction, which means that I can discharge, which means this, the opposite of this, must be the case. What's the opposite of this? Well, it is not Y or not W, right? Lines 4 through 15. Um, lines 4 through 15, indirect proof, right? Now, one thing I'll notice is that I mentioned that some of some of our logicians think this is, you're doing too many steps, that at each step you should only do one thing at a time. Um, and some of you may say that, well, the opposite of this would require you to put a negation in the front. Of course, then you just use a double negation and get this. Um, to me, it seems fairly clear that that's the opposite because of the parentheses. Um, so some so some people may do the sequence longer. In fact, I think your Applia system does it a little bit longer here. But this is basically the proof of how you do it. You can see where I sort of began to get tripped up was I forgot that the reason I did this was in order to use line one. And I sort of skipped that and then I sort of got started thinking for a moment there, I was thinking, well, could I build could I use a um I was thinking, could I use a transposition here? I'm not a transposition. A, um, um, I was thinking, could I use an equivalence here? No, no, I'm sorry, an implication here. Uh, but you can see, I would have to. I could, if I did a commutation, and then a material implication. What I would end up with is um, W then X. But if I had W then X, I'm not sure how that would help me. Well, I could do, well, yeah, you could do um, uh, hypothetical solution, say if you have W, then you have U. Uh, but you can see here, the problem is if I have W, then I have U, I still am going to need this not U to get the not W. So I could have done it in an alternate way, and I was thinking about that, but it still would have required me to do this. Um, so that's an indirect proof. So anyway, I'm going to stop this video because it's already almost an hour long. 
Um, but hopefully you can see here how some how we do some of these problems. I mean, this will help take your time with these and just step through them one by one. Okay. Thank you very much for watching online. I'll see you guys online.